Good evening everyone, my name is Kate and welcome to our presentation of Burnside Unbound, where we bring our author events to you in the comfort of your own home. Tonight we are chatting to award-winning historical fiction and romance author Karen Turner. Welcome Karen. Hi, thanks Kate. You're welcome. Now, a big thank you to our attendees who are zooming in on our conversation with Karen this evening. If you would like me to ask Karen a question on your behalf, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and type in your question. If you can't see the icon, just let your cursor hover over the base of the Zoom screen. Now grab your cuppa or glass of wine and sit back and relax. So Karen, thank you again so much for joining us this evening and you're Zooming in from Victoria where we all know you have been in a stay in stage four of restrictions. What's this time been like for you? I'm actually luckier than some because I'm not in the Melbourne metro area. So I live on the border of uh, Victoria, New South Wales. I'm about five kilometres east of Wodonga in a place called Bandiana. So we're still at stage three, although we have to wear our masks everywhere we go. I went to the optometrist today wearing my mask. It was a very interesting experience. Um, but uh, it's been it's been interesting. It's it's uh, for me a, a great opportunity to do a lot more of these author talks. For example, um, tonight I'm visiting South Australia. Uh, Thursday I'll be in Queensland. Um, this is the sort of opportunity that I have at the moment that isn't necessarily available when we're not in lockdown, when you have to physically get on a plane and do these things. But uh, the current situation we're in now means that so many more of us are communicating um, and getting to meet so many more of you, which is a great opportunity, really. Thank you. Um, so your first publishing experience was a compilation of short stories called All That and Everything. Even some of these stories winning awards. Yes. What was that experience like for you, getting your work published for the first time and then receiving awards for these short stories? Uh, the awards came first and it was, it was quite a, a, a shock to me um, because I, had, I was doing a job where I was the only person in the office and uh, it was a quiet time so I was noodling around on the internet and I saw a short story competition and I'd always kind of fancied myself as a bit of a fiction writer. So I wrote a short story in um, the matter of a couple of hours about my morning train commute and uh, entered it into the competition and about a month later I received a phone call to say that it had won first prize and uh, nobody would have been more surprised than I was. It was just incredible um so i thought <laughs> it could be a fluke let's try again so i entered other competitions and starting to started to get involved in competitions and um found i started winning um first prizes second prize first prize first prize and i thought okay this is this is great um my mum suggested there weren't many other people entering these competitions but that's <laughs> what mums are supposed to do um, <laughs> So, but in the, um, in the, along the way, I said to my dad, who was doing, uh, he's a little uh, sketch artist, and I said to my dad, wouldn't it be really cool if we did a book together where we put my short stories in the book and you did these little sketches to go with each story and we could publish just a little book for the, you know, family and friends. And he, he was thrilled and he said, oh, what a great idea. Um, and then unfortunately my dad passed away so he he never got to do that and um it was about a year later and i was talking to my brother about it and my brother and i went through some of dad's sketchbooks and found some sketches that didn't quite match the stories that kind of worked and um so it was about a year later that i actually um put together all that and everything and uh, dedicated it to my dad because he would have been dead chuffed about having, you know, some sketches of his in there. And, um, yeah, that's, that's how that came about. So, unfortunately, it was supposed to be for me and dad and uh, he never got to see it. But uh, it's still there and his memory lives on with the, the sketches that I do have in there. 
Yeah, so that was great in in the way that the um, that the books came out after the awards. Um, but then yeah. I about yeah. it. So sorry to hear about that. Oh no! Do you know what was really cool though? Uh, Dimix um, took up the book, and it ended up in the, in Dimix. And one day, I received a phone call from a lady at Dimix in Camberwell, and she said to me, "Oh, Karen." I just thought you might like to know that we've done a stock take and one of your books has been stolen. And I thought, I made it. I heard somebody <laughs> stole my book. <laughs> so that's credibility, is it? In the, that's right. In the <laughs> I'm there. I've made it. I'm at the pinnacle of my career. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, so let's talk about your trilogy. Um, so Torn is the title, obviously, of the Torn, trilogy. The first one. The first one. Um, yes. And it's been described as a darker version of Downton Abbey. <laughs> Do you agree with that comment or do you disagree? Oh, you know what? I'll go with that. Yeah. yeah. With that. Okay. <laughs> why do you think that might be? Do you know why that is the case? Um, I think uh, I had a lot of feedback from people telling me that um, the descriptions of the houses and the countryside and the, the clothes that people were wearing and um, the amount of detail that I went into in terms of the way people lived their everyday lives. Um, I saw a, a few reviews come up online when uh, Torn was first released and people were calling it Downton Abbey only 100 years later. And I thought, hey, OK, let's, let's, let's call it that. Um, I, the way I write is um, people have described it as cinematic and I think my writing style, I don't know how other writers do it, but I never plot anything in writing. It, it's always in my head and I, I see it rolling out like a movie and I hear the dialogue and I hear the characters and I see the settings and, um, and then I write it down so that the reader gets to see it as well. And maybe because of that, people have called it cinematic, Downton Abbey, that kind of thing. I, I, look, I don't really mind why they call it that the fact that they do is really cool. That's quite a unique writing style. Um, I heard an interview with uh, Fleur Ferris and she writes like that too, that mm. if that um, imagery keeps going over in her head, then um, it will get on the page. If it stops going over in her head, she goes on with another scene, so to speak. So, mm. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah just... it's exactly like that. I'm, I'm sure there's some help you can get for things like this, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it works for me and it works for Fleur, so... Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's hear a little bit about uh, Torn and um, Inviolate. Um, can you give okay. us a bit of a rundown of those two and then we'll go yes. on to Stormbird. Okay, well Torn tells the story of Alexander Broughton and I'll just get the book like that. And uh, it starts off where she's a 14 year old girl. She's living in Yorkshire and she, uh, her mother remarries and uh, two new siblings join the family. And along the way, she's um, because she's at that age where she's um, young ladies, it's set in Regency time, and young ladies in that time, at that age, their education is almost finished and then they start preparing to be married off and that kind of thing. Whereas she doesn't know any of this. And her brother and her new brother, her stepbrother, they get to go to university, they eventually go to war and fight Napoleon. Um, but for her she suddenly becomes aware that life isn't what she thought it was going to be. She thought that it was going to be this, this idyllic existence in the country. And um, there's one point in it where she says she would probably uh, be married, have children and fall in love in that order. Um, and that's what was charted out for young ladies at the time. But she's, she's suddenly, it's almost like she's slapped back down to earth when she realises that this is what her future actually is. Her mother um, arranges to marry her to somebody that uh, she she really detests. Uh, is quite inappropriate for her. But then she falls in love with somebody equally uh, inappropriate. And along the way, because it's a coming of age story, it starts off when she's young, but it finishes when she's about 19. And it follows her through those, that period of time where she's really growing to womanhood and understanding that the world isn't the sort of place that she thought it was. Um, Inviolate is the sequel and I really, really enjoyed writing this one because in this one she is older, 
So I get to explore life in that time for an older lady. So um, we deal with issues uh, that are probably quite relevant today too, in terms of she, she, um, we deal with some uh, violence, some the problems with the family at war, we deal with um, an inappropriate marriage, we deal with all sorts of different things that, um, that she goes through. Some of the experiences she has are quite harrowing. And um, all the while, she's haunted by the, the memory of this one man that she, she fell in love with in the first book and um, how that shapes her life and, and how she changes her life to try to take control and, and rather than have things happen to her, um, start to impose herself on her life and take charge of it. And so where Torn starts off with her very sheltered and very naive and learning what the world is about, in Violate is where she sums it all up, she's figured it out and then she runs with it. And um, I think um, the two books, I'm, I'm really proud of them. I really, really enjoyed writing them. And um, yeah, they've they've received some terrific reviews. Torn is on its second print because we we sold out the first print, and then uh, we went to a second print, and then around the time we released in Violate. So, were any of them stolen? No, not to my knowledge. <laughs> okay. Not to my knowledge. It'd be nice if they were. <laughs> So um, in Stormbird, you've got the same location, but a whole new family. Stormbird is the third one. Now, it can be read as the third book in the series, but it can also be read independently. Now, Stormbird is set in 1941 during the World War II, and it's set in the same house. And the lady that's living here is a widow. Her um, husband is killed very early on in the war. And she's raising two children in this house. Now, in Alexandra's time, this house was a lovely home, a lovely manor house in the country. Um, but 100 and so years later, it's actually quite run down. It's dilapidated. Jessica, my character, is living there with her children. She's running a small farm to try and make ends meet. And uh, England is at war with Germany. And um, she happens to come across a Luftwaffe pilot that has been shot down and he's wounded and he's hiding in her barn. And so she faces a moral dilemma. Um, do I turn him over to the authorities or do I nurse him back to health? So she thought... Well, my husband was killed, but if a German lady had found my husband, what would I have wanted her to do? And once she asked herself that question, she thought that the answer was fairly clear. So she decided to nurse Anton back to health. And along the way, they form an unlikely friendship, which develops into something more. The problem is, in a time of war, if you're harbouring the enemy, you might as well be the enemy. And... Um, the authorities know there's a German out there somewhere. They found the plane. They know he's out there somewhere. They start to suspect Jessica and then a series of events are triggered that are um, quite terrifying. So it's a drama. It's exciting. There's a lot of the war detail. There's a lot of history in it. Um, but it's also essentially a romance as well. Mm. I'm just wondering, I mean, before you said that you're not a planner um, in terms of the plot, but... Was Jessica in your mind at all when you were writing Torn and Inviolate? Yes, I, I, she was, not um, specifically the way she turned out. But interestingly, Stormbird was the book that I had in mind to write first. And okay. when I started writing Stormbird, I realised that I needed to weave another story around it and um, because it's the same house. And... Um, I started going back and giving some thought to Alexandra and her life story. And then she sort of took over. And the connection between the two is a diary that Jessica finds in the house. And um, it's Alexandra's diary. And when I started weaving all of these together, I realised that I really had to tell Alexandra's story first and understand her and what sort of life she's had and how that can impact Jessica. Because some of the decisions that Alexandra makes impact 
Jessica in a way that um, Jessica may or may not do certain things based on what Alexandra has read it, written in her diary. And it's, it's this theme that flows through. It's the loosely connected, but if you read Stormbird without reading Torn and Inviolate, you wouldn't miss out on anything. I'd like people to read all three in a row because I wrote them that way, but they don't have to be written, uh, read that way. Yeah. Well, I certainly read um, Stormbird first and I uh, haven't... Had you haven't missed out on anything? Follow, following the storyline at all. Yeah, that's fact, terrific. That historical element creates this nice little sort of a treasure that unfolds uh, as the story goes along. Yeah, yeah. Next, I've had a lot of people say that actually. A lot of people, because Stormbird is uh, was only released last year, a lot of people have said, "Oh, new book, new book." I've read Stormbird, and then, hang on, what's this other story I've heard about? And then they go back, and I'm getting a lot of feedback about that, which is quite satisfying that it worked. I thought of this. This could either go horribly wrong, or it could actually work, and it seems to have worked. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing that's worked really well is mixing the romance genre with the historical fiction genre. So how did you go about um, combining those two? Was it a difficult writing process or, um, you know, were you tempted to follow the, the, the formula in both of them? Because it doesn't come across like that. Mm. Um, no, I wasn't. I always wanted to write it this way. One of my favourite authors is a lady called Pamela Bell and she writes historical fiction. It's They're, it, they're romantic elements, but they're very factual. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I read Pamela Bell's books or oh, maybe about 30 odd years ago and I just loved that idea of taking fact and weaving a story around it. And, I mean, who doesn't love romance? I've always loved romance books. Um, so just taking the fact and putting two people of my choice in there and creating this lovely story that fits in with history. And um, it's, it wasn't even something I've thought about consciously because I always set out to write a historically factual book but with the romantic element as well. And for those of you who are listening, um, Karen is a financial writer. <laughs> for my sins. Come from. Yeah. So it's almost like you've got this lovely creative outlet oh. um, on the side with all this boring <laughs> financial writing on. <laughs> oh, you said it. You said it. Oh, I tell you what. I think maybe that's why I like the romantic fiction as well because it is so far removed from superannuation benefits and, you know, estate planning and insurance and all the other stuff, legislative financial changes, and it's just so different that it's, I um, yeah, <laughs> couldn't be any further different. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to ask you a quick question about Jessica's character development. Um, how do you go about um, crafting that in your stories and through different edits and different drafts? Um, I find it a, a frustrating exercise because you know, they say, and I always say, I run a lot of um, writing workshops and I'm always saying to people, when you write your first draft, it is your first draft. It has warts in it. It has mistakes in it. It has, your characters aren't fully developed. Your plot's not fully developed, but you just get it down. It's when you go through the edits and the changes and the redrafts that you start to develop that. As I mentioned before, I see the characters in my mind, I hear them, I see what they're wearing, I see what they look like, they start to become real to me. Once I've got that structure in my head and I start writing my first draft, I find that they still aren't fully formed, if that makes sense. So, you know, um, I always knew that Jessica would have lovely thick red hair, I knew that she'd be slim, I, I knew that she was a gentle but a bit shy, I knew that through the, the story she would um, find her inner strength and start making decisions and standing on her own feet a lot more and I could see that development in her. I could also see why somebody like Anton would fall in love with her and I could see how she had a lot of love to give somebody else as well and I knew all of these things about her but Enriching her to the point where the reader could know that without me saying it um, was through edits and redrafts and, you know, really honing her, tightening it up and, and 
moulding her so that someone reading it could actually see her the same way that I could. Mm -hmm. And that takes time. For me, the first draft is a frustration because I can see her, but I haven't got that detail in her yet, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, and I just absolutely love the tension that you've crafted between Anton and Jessica and the build-up of that, um, you know, the way at the start of the novel. Um, are they tricky scenes to create or do you actually enjoy that part of it, the, you know, the wordsmithing, I guess? Um, are we talking about the love scenes or are we talking about the... Um, the, the sexual the tension. Stuff? The sexual tension. Yeah, creating those. Ah, I, I actually... <laughs> I'll let you into a secret. Um, I'm not really good at writing those. And when I wrote um, Torn, um, I found it very, very difficult, and, and also in Violate, where Alex is older, I found it very, very difficult writing the romantic scenes. And at what point do I draw the line? There's a term, you know, called leaving the bedroom door open. Is my bedroom door open or closed? Am I, is my reader seeing it or do I shut the bedroom door and the reader has to just use your imagination? I found it very difficult to straddle the line. I didn't want to start writing detail, but I wanted the reader to see enough for it to be romantic. Um, so after I wrote Torn and in Violate, I went through a little writing exercise where I rewrote um, Torn and Inviolate from another character's point of view. And uh, this particular character is a male who is quite um, a rake for his day. And he's into all sorts of things. Um, he's, he's very popular with the ladies. He likes to drink and gamble and party on dude. So um, I wrote a series of short stories, basically retelling Torn from his point of view. Um, and that was and a, just an exercise, not to be published or anything, just for your own creative. Well, there's, there's talk about them being published as okay. a uh, companion to Torn. Um, they'll need to have uh, some editing and a fair bit of work done to them. But it was an exercise for me to practice writing um, these scenes in more detail because I like to leave the bedroom door open when, you know, I'm reading these books. I like to know a little bit more than I was putting into it. And I thought I just need to learn to not be so shy. Um, you know, there, were, there was a scene in Stormbird, you might even know the one I'm talking about, and I was blushing and getting all embarrassed. I've been, I've been married for 20 years and here I'm getting all hot and bothered writing this scene. Um, but having written the stories from the other character's point of view uh, and exploring a, a different writing style, I had more confidence in Stormbird to explore that in, in more detail. Um, Building the tension wasn't difficult. I I feel like I did a really good job of that on Torn and in Violate as well. But it's showing the detail that uh, I wasn't sure about doing. Mm, thank you. Um, I'll just invite our listeners to um, type in any questions that you have for Karen while I ask a couple more. Um, your research is uh, quite heavy in um, in all of your books, I imagine. So would you like to talk us through your process of the his historical research you do for these? Um, the well, Torn and Inviolate, um, well, first of all, they, you know, one of the golden rules is to read what you write. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you read, you, know, you want to write children's stories, read children's stories. I was reading a lot of uh, Regency fiction, um, but also the place. Um, when I was 19, I was saving up for my first car and uh, my mother's side of the family comes from Yorkshire. And instead of buying my first car, I bought an airline ticket and went to Yorkshire and lived with my grandma in a little village called uh, Otley, which is on the outskirts of Leeds. It is in this book. It's not called Otley. It's called Bulston. And, um, but all the street names, all the places, you know, all the other villages, they're all the same. They're exactly as I've, descri I've described in the books. You might remember in Stormbird, Jessica goes to Leeds and I talk about the streets and the, the station and it's real. That is exactly what it is. 
So I spent, I spent some time living there. I visited these places. And, and to be honest, that's what made me fall in love with the, the genre and I feel that I had to write stories. The stories were coming to me while I was over there and I, it just took a few years before I was able to start writing properly. Um, so research for these books was quite easy um, because it's, it's real history. It's, it's touchable history. You, when you go to the UK, it's right there in front of you and you can touch it and you can see it and you can visit places. I talk about places like Fountains Abbey, um, you know, Leeds Station, the, the canals, the villages, the markets, the cemeteries, the everything. It's all real and tangible. And so when I go to these places, you just have to look around and I make a lot of notes. I've always got little notebooks with me and I write down what things look like and what they seem like. And then a lot of villages in the UK have photos of uh, what happened in history and um, because they're all such old, old places. And Otley is a market town outside of Leeds, about four miles out of Leeds. So you go there and the history is all there. So one of the best ways to research is to go there and uh, it brings it to life for you. Um, additionally, there were things I had to research, like, for example, oh. back in the day, the young men would wear a dress sword and they called the young men blades. And that's, that was the really cool term. I mean, we, we might call them dudes or blokes or something like that these days, but they were blades and they carried this dress sword. And I, I started thinking about it one day and I thought, Wow, I mean, you've got this thing that must be a, you know, a metre long dangling off your hip. That's got to be a little inconvenient. Um, <laughs> so what does it feel like? Is it heavy? Um, does it, you know, when you wave it around, what does it do? Is it, you know, they talk about them being well balanced. You've got the belt that they hang on, which is called a baldric, which I didn't know. Um, so I started researching swords just to see what they looked like, what they felt like, what, you know, how ornate they might have been. Was there any meaning in the design in them and what it was like to hang them from yourself and walk around and did you have to move carefully? And, um, you know, they never show you all of that in movies, but to be real, um, you have to know. There is only one scene where I really use any information about the sword, but because I knew that information, I could describe the way my character might walk and um, how he might move and how he would enter a door, how he might sit down. None of that mentioned the sword, but because I could see it in my mind's eye, I was able to put it down so that the reader could see that he walked in a certain way or he stepped a certain way so that the sword didn't knock a vase off a table or you know, um, slice a lady's shin or, you know. So that kind of research, just putting yourself in the place, what did they eat? Um, how did they make the food? It was the same in, um, in Stormbird. Um, the research for that was very, very different because it's set in 1941. My mum was born in Leeds in 1941, which is why I chose the year. My mum was telling me stories about how she never knew what toothpaste was until she migrated to Australia. They used to use the soot from inside the chimney. I mean, we think about charcoal now being wonderful for your teeth. Well, they, they already knew that. They were using it during the war because you couldn't get toothpaste. These little anecdotes were things that I just knew. So to, to do further research, um, there was a book I bought that went through Yorkshire living day by day during the war. It was a brilliant book and it just had little, little snippets of information about what the baker was doing during the war, um, what the plumber was doing during the war, what school teachers were doing during the war, and just a, like a couple of paragraphs on their daily life and their daily routine, uh, little songs that school children sang. And there's a little song in Stormbird that the, her son sings, you might recall, and that's a real song. I didn't make that up. And um, these little pieces of, of history, um, I find really bring a story together. So while you know the peripheral history, you know about the war, you know who was in it, you know what happened, to bring it to life in a way that readers can put themselves in that house with my characters, I have to go into more detail. And that was the, the research that, that I, I was doing. And uh, I learned a lot. I also learned uh, a lot of respect 
for my mum and my grandma who lived in the time. And my, my grandma lost her husband very early in the war. So my mum was raised without a father and uh, it was very tough. And I now have a, a much greater respect for what it must have been like for them during that time. Yep. And um, one of the characters, Anton, is obviously a German national. So in, uh, interspersed in his language is his English are uh, some German words. Did you, um, do you know a bit of German yourself or did you research that? Um, uh, had some help I, <laughs> a bit of both. I did speak some German as a child. Um, we had a very dear family, family friend who was Swiss and um, he didn't have any friends or sorry, any relatives of his own in Australia. So he said to me one day as a little girl, I have nothing to pass on to anybody but my language. So I'm not going to speak English to you anymore. So as a little girl, I was speaking fluent German with the Swiss dialect. Yeah. Um, I don't remember any of it, but little things like, you know, shut up, I'm trying to read the paper and don't forget to take your umbrella and <laughs> is that a good book? And, you know, little things that are completely useless. But, uh, you know, and just you every... Read a novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so I certainly, some of the words that Anton used in there, I certainly wasn't taught by my, my uncle. Um, however, I do some volunteer work at an animal shelter in Italy. And um, the volunteers come from all around the world. And one lady I met was German. And when I, I said to her, I'm writing a book and I really need some help with the language. And she very kindly offered to help. So um, it was probably about a year later, I was at that point where I really, I had written down what I thought was right. And I put it all in a spreadsheet and I had my column of what I think is right, what I want it to mean and what it should be and asked her to fill in the third column. And, um, and I emailed that to her. She was back in Germany at that time and I'm back in Australia and she filled it all out for me and sent it back. And so all my German was <laughs> verified by a national. So that was very helpful. That's great. And you can't rely on Google. I've read some books um, mm -hmm. where the writer has clearly relied on Google for translations and it's, um, and I speak Italian. So when, uh, you know, you read a book and they've got some Italian language in there and I think no mate you can't no not Google don't use Google <laughs> <laughs> I guess especially with German too because there are nouns or verbs that go at the end of a sentence that we, we yes yeah, so yeah well um, Italian and French are the same you, are when, the same? Uh, when you describe something like for example um, my cup is red so I've got a red cup they would describe it as a, a cup red um, they, they, their syntax is quite different mm -hmm. from from ours uh, so, yeah, I had to make sure I was getting all sorts of things right. The, the other interesting thing, too, is that um, in the German language, written language, all nouns are capitalised. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realise that. And when um, my friend came back and she'd capitalised all these nouns, I thought, oh, OK, that's, I see that. Yeah, I, something's triggering a memory. And when my editor, who is a, an English lady living in the UK, when she was editing it, she uncapitalized them and I said no 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 they, they actually have to be capitalized it's just it's the way Germans write their nouns they're always capitalized and you know what many years ago in uh, English English we we did that we used to capitalize nouns but this is way back when uh, we were still influenced by the Saxons so no surprises there mm -hmm. Um, despite the heavy editing, it seems like you really enjoy uh, the process of writing um, fiction. Yeah, but I do. you actually nearly gave up on writing at one point altogether. Can you tell us a little bit about that, even before you really started? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, you know what? I, I had always wanted to be a writer. Even as a little girl, I'd wanted to be a writer. And there was a time when I was in my early 20s and I was reading oh, I think it was like a TV guide or something. Back in the day when we used to get the weekly one in the newspaper, you know, every the Sunday newspaper would come out with a, a, news, a TV guide flipped out. And I remember on the back of this thing, there was a, an advertisement for a writing course. And it was about $700, I remember, because I just, I had about $700 in savings. 
And um, I thought, okay, this is great. I'm going to learn. This is what I'm going to spend my money on. And it was a correspondence course. So you would sit there, you would be given, uh, allocated a tutor, you did an assignment, you sent it off, they would review it and give you feedback. Bought myself a typewriter because we didn't have computers back then. Signed up for this course, spent all my, my hard earned money on it and got my assignment, did my first assignment, sent it off. My tutor said, oh yeah, this is lovely. You know, red pen, red pen, came back. <laughs> I think I was into about the third assignment and that assignment was to um, write a memoir of um, an incident, like a, a, you know, of a, a memoir of a historical detail and uh, in a short story. And um, so I wrote a memoir from my grandmother's perspective of how she drove an ambulance around Leeds during the war, helping the uh, rescuers pull out the rubble and try to find people still alive within the, the bombed out houses. And um, I sent that off and it came back and it was just this big line straight through the whole lot of it. And he said, when you're asked to write a memoir, write a memoir. Don't write rubbish that you can't possibly expect people to believe. Oh, my goodness. And I was mortified because that was a true story. My grandmother used to drive ambulances around Leeds during the war to help rescue people trapped in the bombed out buildings. So for me, I thought, good grief, is my writing so bad that he can't see that this was a true story. It wasn't something I just fantastical thing I'd made up. So at that point, I, I quit the course and uh, lost my money and didn't write a single word for would have been at least 10 or 15 years. Oh, goodness. And uh, yeah, it wasn't until I saw this uh, short story advertisement and I thought I'm going to give that a go. And um, the rest is history. Yeah. So I don't even know this tutor's name now, but I would love to, you know, if I knew who he was, I'd be going, mate, would you like a copy of my first novel? Oh, hang on. Would you like a copy of my second novel? <laughs> and third. And, and third. Yeah, that's right. Have you still got that story about the memoir of your grandma? Oh, but you know what? I was so upset, honestly. I gathered up all, and I think I had done about three assignments at that time, and it was a 10 month course so there would have been 10 and I think I, I just gathered the three up that I had done and just thrown them out I was just I was devastated I was mortified I was embarrassed um yeah and he was probably laughing all the way to the bank so <laughs> we've the lessons to a lot of authors who um you know have had rejection after rejection after rejection has that been your experience as well oh yeah rejection's yeah. my middle name <laughs> um, um torn and inviolate well torn um torn was self-published and i did that with the same publisher that did the book of short stories but then torn did so well that when it was time to publish inviolate the publisher actually said we'll do this ourselves under our imprint and what's more is we'll do the reprint of Torn because Torn had sold out so um, even though Torn was self-published it became the imprint of Palmer Higgs who subsequently went out of business which is not a really good comment about my book sales but um, when it came time to publish Stormbird I because I, I didn't have a publisher anymore because he'd gone out of business, um, I thought, all right, I really believed in this book. I really, really did. And one of the things that you should do is persist. It is one of the most important words in a writer's vocabulary. When you, it comes to submitting and trying to get an agent or trying to get a publisher, persist, persist, persist. If you've got this belief you know, get it out there and just keep trying. So I kept writing letter after letter, submission after submission, and they'd all come back with rejections. Oh, you know, I was getting rejections that didn't make sense. People saying, oh, we just loved it, and your character development, and the story, and oh, we couldn't stop reading, but now nah, we can't publish it at this point. 
It's like contradictory. <laughs> you went through this trouble of not even just sending me the standard Dear John letter, but the, the a whole detailed rejection letter telling me how great it was. And then, sorry, it doesn't fit on our shelves at the moment. So in the end, I broke all the rules. I was so angry. I just remember one day um, I was sitting in a, an apartment in Italy and because uh, I'd, I'd gone there to, to write and focus on my work. And um, I just sat and I just sent off all these letters. They're all coming back with rejections. And then this particular day I'd had enough. There had been one agent that I really thought it was a perfect match. I thought this is this has gone. I just had a good feeling about it, and I got the rejection from her. And I thought I've had enough, so I just belted off this email. I found. I thought I'd, I'd think out of the box because this is set in Yorkshire. I got online. I looked up publishers in Yorkshire, and I wrote this email. I didn't tell him anything about the book. I said to him. Um, I'm introducing myself. My name's Karen. I'm from Australia. I eat way too much chocolate, but I'm the only one that thinks that's important. Um, I rattle off all this other stuff. I, by the way, I've written a book called Stormbird. I really would like you to have a look at it. But in, you know, in the meantime, did I tell you I eat a lot of chocolate? And um, <laughs> anyway, and then I wrote something else about um, I've submitted my first three chapters for your choose one of the above, you know, reading pleasure, destruction, fire fuel, yeah, and, you know, tick which box is most appropriate. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. He came back to me the next day and said, oh, I just love your style. Um, we'd like to look at the full manuscript. And, and that's when I panicked. That's when I thought, oh, my God. Oh, my God. No, <laughs> That doesn't happen. What, what's he talking about? And I rang up my husband and I said, he wants to see the manuscript. And Stuart goes, well, send it to him. So <laughs> anyway, I sent it to him and the rest is history. He signed me um, a couple of weeks later and that's Stormbird. And that's persistence, isn't it? And that's That was persistence and losing the plot. Basically, I just <laughs> almost sanity. I'd had enough. And you know what? I think it was because I'd got to the point where you know, you know, you, your um, submissions have to be so structured. You know, your your opening letter has to be only three paragraphs, introducing a bit of a bio, a story, and then you've got you know, you, you they might want five thousand words, they might want ten thousand words, they might want three chapters, they might want one chapter, they might want a synopsis, they might want, you know, you never know. They all want something different. You jump through hoops, you bend over backwards, you do everything that they want. And they all say, no. Nah. So I broke the rules and here I am. And I thought, well, I don't advocate that. I don't think it's always good. I think I was lucky. And I think I was really, really angry and didn't care anymore. <laughs> and that, lack of, that complacency was like probably what got me over the line. Um, it's, it really is when it all boils down to it, being in the right place at the right time, and the right people and I have since learned that there are many many times when I came so close to being published but it wasn't the right time for that particular book because vampires were all the rage and I don't have any vampires in my books or sometimes it might be you know rescue dogs are all the rage and I don't have a rescue dog in my book so you know it really is about the right book the right time the right person and if all the stars are in alignment, it works. Yeah. <laughs> You've given some really valuable advice for budding authors who are sitting there, sitting on a manuscript. <laughs> um, but also you offer some writing workshops for, um, for people. Yes, yes. I've actually got a workshop that is just about to come out. In fact, um, talking to a library in um, Melbourne at the moment that uh, would like to run a writing workshop. And because I had written one uh, course outline for, um, for when we're out of lockdown and able to go back and do face-to-face -face things. And uh, because I do love that and I, I am a qualified facilitator and public speaker, it's basically what I had to do a lot of the time for financial work. Um, so putting together a course about something I'm passionate about was so much more fun. And, I've written a six week course, which is called Let's Write a Book. And it covers the first 
well, each week is a, it's about a one and a half hour session every Saturday morning or whichever day you want to do it. And you learn different aspects of writing. So one day might be plotting, one day might be character mm -hmm. development, one day might be um, passive voice versus active voice, um, show, don't tell, all these different things. And then at the end, we pull it all together and now you're ready to start writing your first draft. And it's all, it's all preparatory stuff, how to research, how not to research, all these sorts of things, activities within the class, activities for you to go and do when you go home that we can talk about and workshop the next session. Um, so I've got all of that ready to go. And uh, the, first, the first sessions are due to start in about two weeks' time. So very much looking forward to that. And um, any viewers who are interested in um, having a look at that can go onto your new website. So oh, do you want to tell us a, a little bit about your new website? <laughs> oh, my new website? I tell you, I'm so chuffed with this because I did it myself. I was, uh, oh. and this is what lockdown's been so good for me. I've learned these new skills. I had, um, my husband is a, a tech person, in other words, nerd. And um, he was always looking after my website and I'd be constantly hounding him about, oh, I think we need to change that. Oh, I need to do this. And um, anyway, it just wasn't happening. He's flat out. He, he works in the finance industry as well and he's flat out at the moment. And he said to me, oh, look, you know, I know you need these things. I know I just don't have time. And I've, I've done the whole, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That's fine. I understand, you know, the passive aggressive wife thing. And... Um, <laughs> So I got online and started Googling. I'm like, how hard can this be? You know, this can't be that hard. I write presentations, for goodness sake. So I got online and I found a, a site and I learned how to do it. I got onto LinkedIn Learn and I, I did a little course and I learned how to do all of this stuff. And then I got a site and I built my own website and then I launched it and it works. Even the links work and the clicks work. And because I was so excited, I'm selling Torn for a dollar nine, actually. I'm selling Torn for 99 cents, but the sellers put 20 cents on it. So <laughs> it comes out to be a dollar nine. But uh, yes, yeah, so anybody that wants to go and check out my website can download an e-version of Torn for a dollar nine. That's a pretty good bargain. It is a bargain, <laughs> but better than that, check out my website. I'm really pleased. <laughs> yeah, and what is your website just for those? Um, it's uh, www.karenturner.com.au. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Well, Karen, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you tonight. You've given Thank us you. far more insight into the, the writer's craft than, um, than I was expecting. So thank you very much. And we wish you, you every success with the final instalment of the trilogy, Stormbird. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really enjoy having a chat with people like yourselves. Well, thank you. Um, so to our listeners tonight, thank you very much for Zooming in with us online. And we hope you've enjoyed your time with Australian award-winning author Karen Turner. So um, just a little plug before I say goodbye. Um, Thursday evening, we have quite a special event. Um, John Wood, who's the Gold Logie winner and star of Rafferty's Rules and Blue Healers, will be chatting with me. Um, and we'd love to see you then for that event too. So thank you again, everybody. And a special thank you to Karen for joining us on Burnside Unbound. Thanks for having me. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Good night. Bye.